we all understand water uh, cycles very actively and dynamically around our planet. You can see uh, some of the processes happening here, which um, we think of we see as kind of fundamental fluxes in the water cycle, global water cycle. Uh, and some of the ones that we see here, you know, it may be obvious, we've got clouds, rain falling out of the clouds, right? They're carrying water that has a certain isotope ratio. We want to think about how, what sets that isotope ratio and what it can tell us. Um, you can see a dry landscape here, right? This is the Eastern Sierras. Um, what's happening to that water that's falling out of that cloud? What's that? <laughs> Probably a little bit of absorption into the ground, but a lot of it is moving away. Okay, so it hits the ground. It's going to, well, first off, some of it hits the ground. But if you look carefully here, a lot of this is probably not reaching the ground, right? So this is a pretty common phenomenon out here. Today is an exception, but a lot of our rain in the summer never hits the ground, right? We get what's called virga, um, some cloud evaporation. And so processes like that, right, are going to have an effect on the isotopes. Um, did Tariq talk about evaporation at all yesterday? Isotope fraction, isotope evaporation? No? Yes, maybe? A little bit. We're not sure? Okay. Well, that, so we'll come back and pick that up, but that's one of the fractionating processes that um, is really key in water cycle. And then as you said, this water, if it hits the ground, it can go one of several directions. And so ultimately, you know, when we're talking about how we use isotopes, we can use them to trace sources, um, like what sources contribute to a particular mixture of a substrate, water. Or we can uh, use them to identify and characterize processes, usually isotope fractionating processes. Right? Both of these are things we're going to do with water. So um, the plan for today, we're going to start by talking about principles that kind of underlie isotope distributions in the water cycle. Right? What are the things that happen? Where is the action in terms of isotopes? And then we're going to look at some case studies, some examples showing specifically at kind of larger scales how we can uh, look at isotopic variability and environments at regional and continental global scales and characterize the processes that are happening to understand how water is moving through systems using the isotopes. And these are some of the uh, examples that if we have time to touch on. Alright, so uh, when we are talking about isotopes uh, in water, there's really kind of two things in this. Any isotope system, the way I like to think about it is source, process, right? So the isotope composition of material X, Y, or Z that you got in the sample, right, is going to be set by the isotope composition of the sources that contributed matter to that thing that you have in your bottle, your vial, you put in your mass spectrometer, right, and if the source composition varies, then you would expect the substrate that you're measuring to vary right, as well. And by the processes that are transferring that matter from the source to your sample. Right? If they're isotopically fractionating and discriminating, then that's going to affect the offset between the sources and the measure. The main fractionating process that we see when we're looking at the water cycle is phase change. Okay? We have both equilibrium kinetic effects when we evaporate water, when we condense water. <coughs> and these things uh, affect the isotope ratios. We're going to be dealing with two elements. Right, H2O. We've got H's and we've got O's. And we can look at and take advantage of both elements. We have traditionally four isotopes that we think of. Right? Protium and deuterium. Uh, stable isotopes, protium and deuterium. And then oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. I think you'll probably hear a little bit uh, about oxygen 17 at some point. I'm going to ignore it. Traditionally, we've ignored it. But O17 is kind of coming on the scene. And that provides another tracer, another isotope. And so ultimately, we have you know, traditionally three parameters, the hydrogen isotope composition, delta 2H, oxygen isotope ratio, ratio of 18O to 16O. And then a derived parameter we'll look at called deuterium excess, which combines the two. And it looks at how the variation in oxygen isotopes and hydrogen isotopes is coupled or decoupled. Okay, We'll come back to that. We can also add in this uh, parameter uh, cap delta 17O, um, oxygen 17 excess, um, which is kind of analogous to deuterium excess. And again, I'm not going to talk about it, but I think it will come back. All right, and then the second process that we have that we can really think about is mixing. And so this comes back to the source signature, right? Where, what's the source of the water that we've sampled? 
um, is that, and we can think about this in many, many different ways. Where is it coming from spatially, temporally? Like when did that water fall out of the sky? Or um, when was it taken up by a tree or, or whatever? Okay, Jim will get into some of that stuff. But we can look at mixing and we can look at these phase change reactions. These are the two things that kind of really set the isotope compositions. We're going to start with something simple and beautiful that doesn't need to be improved. And I don't know if you can read that up there, but this is a bar of soap that I got at a hotel. It's an attempt to approve the bar of soap, right? I think it's kind of funny. Anyway. Okay. We're going to start with the Craig Gordon or Craig and Gordon. They're actually two different people, but it's often just called the Craig Gordon model. This is a model that uh, goes back to the 1960s. It was developed initially by um, researchers who are thinking about global water cycling and isotopes, and specifically thinking about the ocean. The ocean is the ultimate source of most of the water that ends up in the atmosphere. Right? It gets cycled around, other things happen, but uh, the ocean's where most of the evaporation is happening. Okay? And so if we want to understand the isotope composition of the atmosphere, we, or any other water that cycles through the atmosphere, we need to understand how isotopes are partitioned as water evaporates from the ocean. We're going to do a uh, non-exhaustive and relatively qualitative treatment of the Craig-Gordon model. But I would encourage you to go look at it and think about it and go back and the derivation for this one is actually from the, from the kind of conceptual ideas we're going to talk about here is actually kind of fun to do mathematically. So if you have a chance, if you like thinking about those things, I encourage you to go play around with it. All right, so this is the system, right? This is the system that we're going to model here. That's the kind of conceptualization of the evaporating water body uh, that's used in this model. And it subdivides the system into basically four parts. We have the water itself, the liquid water, right? And this model, I should say, was developed for the ocean, but it can be applied and has been applied to evaporation from pretty much any type of liquid water body. That thing's kind of clunky. All right, so we've got our water down here, liquid water, and it's evaporating into an atmosphere. And so we subdivide the atmosphere then into a series of slices. The first slice is the boundary layer. Right? The boundary layer is, in an idealized sense, a stagnant, saturated layer of air that's in contact with the water, the liquid water. Okay? It's that layer of air that sits right over the water and that's in active contact where molecules are bouncing back and forth between the liquid phase and the gas phase. Okay. So I'll ask you, if we think about isotope fractionation and our two different flavors of isotope fractionation, equilibrium and kinetic, what do you think is going on between the liquid water layer and the boundary layer? What kind of fractionation would you expect? Equilibrium, equilibrium okay. Key thing here is that the air is saturated. 100% relative humidity. So again, in a very idealized sense, what that means is that every time you move a molecule of water out of the liquid phase into the boundary layer, you need to return a water, a water molecule back. And so you have an even bidirectional exchange right, between the two, and that gives you equilibrium frac. That's you know, what we would expect, or that's the kind of diagnostic condition for equilibrium fractionation. And so what we end up then is establishing an equilibrium offset between the isotopic composition here and here, and we can characterize that um, in terms of an equilibrium fractionation factor, which, again, I'm sure Turi introduced yesterday. Okay. The other layer, the next layer we'll talk about, we're going to skip over the transition zone, and we're going to go up here to the open atmosphere. And this is, sorry, I'm going to try not to beam anybody in the eye with this. Um, the uh, free atmosphere here is the ultimate sink for this water. Right? This is the free, turbulently mixed air that's circulating around. You know, again, it depends on scale. If we think about the ocean, this would be the atmosphere up above you know, a few hundred feet that's mixing freely with the rest of the troposphere and carrying away water vapor that's you know, being evaporated out into it. Okay? The key condition for the open air, two key conditions. One, it's well mixed. Okay, and so molecules that end up there mix out, and it's a big reservoir, okay, and so it's got a you know, fairly stable composition, and, um, and it's undersaturated. Okay. And if we think about evaporation as a process, right, if we want to think about it as a flux of water, if we want to think about the ocean or some other body of water 
moving water molecules out into air, right? That's only going to happen. We're only going to have a net flux if we have this, an atmosphere that's undersaturated, right? Because again, if you think about the whole, if the whole atmosphere had the same saturated condition as the boundary layer, we move molecule up, we move molecule down, we have this equilibrium balance, we have no net flux. There's no net contribution from you know, the liquid pool up to the, uh, the atmosphere. So we have an undersaturated, well mixed, free atmosphere up there. And conditions up there are turbulent, and so in order to connect that free atmosphere to the boundary layer, we need to move molecules back and forth, and that occurs through diffusion. Okay. And so this is the transition zone. This is a zone where you have a gradient of humidity between the saturated boundary layer and the undersaturated free atmosphere. It gets drier as we go up. We have a concentration gradient. Right? And if we have a concentration gradient in a medium you know, like air, we're going to experience diffusion. Right. And diffusion is a you know, bi-directional process. Right? You've got molecules moving up. You've got molecules moving down randomly. Right? I like to think of molecules jiggling around. And there's an equal chance that they're going to go up and go down. But if there's more of them jiggling down here and fewer down he up here, then the net flux is going to be up. Okay. And we get isotope effects associated with diffusion. What kind of fractionation is that? Kinetic fractionation, right? So we've got an imbalanced process. And so we have fractionation going on up there, but it's a different kind of fractionation. It's a kinetic process, right? Driven by that diffusive gradient. And so we've got a combination of these two things going on. Craig Gordon model basically solves for those two, um, two things. Okay. All right, so the Craig Gordon model gives us a way of calculating, given this kind of scheme, what we would expect the isotopic composition of the evaporative flux to be right, out of the ocean. 